Greetings Shaler area, welcome back. This is the 8th note video in Unit 1 and we're going to get started because this is going to be a long one. So this note video is about section 3 of part 2. It's all about measurement. So we're going to talk about lots and lots and lots of different types of ways of measuring matter. So before we start getting into the actual tools and units, let's talk a little bit about the history. Um, it's, it's important to understand why we use the system of measurement that we use, which is called the SI system. Um, some of you might call this or have heard, heard something called the metric system. Um, the metric system actually doesn't exist anymore. What we use is the SI system. The, met the metric system hasn't existed for hundreds of years. So, we're going to talk about length, and then we'll move on to the other ones. But originally, units of length were, were parts of the body. Um, you had the cubit, which was the distance from your elbow to your fingertips. So you could think if you were like kind of walking your arm, putting your elbow down and kind of putting your hand down, and then moving your elbow up to where your hand was, and moving down something like a table, you could figure out how many cubits a house was. Um, the lab tables in the classroom, we could say, are about two and a half cubits long. Uh, this is the earliest known measurement um, of mankind. So according to written history, um, this is the earliest measurement that shows up in our history. So the foot is a very common measurement, um, and it's one that's we still use today, but it was originally the size of a person's foot. All right, This was usually the king or the ruler, because imagine the chaos if we went by everybody's feet. You know, if, uh, if I was going to trade three feet of cloth for you know, three feet of I don't know, bundles of sticks, but if I was trading with someone who was really tiny, they'd be getting a lot more cloth for my bundles of sticks if we were using our own feet. So the king decided, uh, the first one to do this I believe was Charlemagne, um, that they would use his foot instead of everybody's feet. Uh, and he gave everyone a stick that was the length of his foot. And what do you think we call a stick that's the length of one foot? Think about it. The big problem is Everybody's feet are different sizes. And sometimes your feet even grow. The inch was the size of the middle bone of a person's pinky finger. So if you kind of bend your pinky finger over, um, the space between those two knuckles right there, if you actually hold that up against the ruler, is pretty close to an inch. Um, so we had all of these different measurements in early history, and they're all based on body parts because that's the like that was very convenient. It didn't matter where you went, you had your body, so you could use your body to measure things. My son watched a Curious George episode the other day, and uh, Curious George was measuring things by Georges. The, the pole was four Georges high. Um, that's pretty much how people did it. So, if we're going to use the system of measurement um, that we use in the United States, then these are most of the units of length that we use in the US. So um, if we're going to use these in class, then you're going to need to know how to convert from one to another. Alright, so this system of measurement is called the customary system. And if you look at the chart, you know, one inch equals one inch. Um, one inch is one twelfth of a, of a foot because there's 12 inches in a foot. Um, a yard, there is three feet in a yard, and a yard is 36 inches. So, you know, these are all measurements that you're pretty much used to. There are 12 inches in a foot. There are three feet in a yard. Anybody know how many feet are in a mile? This is one of those things that you're kind of expected to know if you're an American and we use these system of this, this system of length. A mile is 5,280 feet. It's a nice round number to remember. That, that was sarcasm. Well, how many yards are in a fathom? 
You might be thinking, I've never heard of a fathom. I can't even fathom what a fathom might be. Well, a fathom is a unit of length that we use in the, in the country. We tend to measure the depth of water in fathoms. And a fathom is two yards long. So a fathom is six feet. Um, they, on, on many ships, at least they used to do this, uh, if they were traveling on rivers, would have a pole that was two fathoms long. Because if you put it down in the water, if the water was two fathoms deep, then it was navigable, which means you could pass a pretty decently sized ship down that river. There happen to be eight furlongs in a mile. A furlong is another unit of measurement that you've probably never heard of, but we use in this country. Um, the only thing I can think of that they measure in furlongs is racetracks involving animals. So like a horse race, they might measure in furlongs. Uh, and I believe they even measure dog races in furlongs. And the last measurement you've probably heard of, but maybe you weren't aware that you've heard of this unit of measurement. This is one that, that most people have at least heard of because it's part of a very famous book title, uh, a very old piece of literature called 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Um, that book title is actually about a depth. It's a, it's a length under the top of the water. Now, unfortunately, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea is really, really far. That's a really long distance. Um, since there's three miles in a league, we're talking 60,000 miles under the sea, and the entire planet isn't that big. So you'd be like through the planet, out the other side, and um, hanging out in space. So these are the measurements that we use in the United States. These are the, the commonly used measurements in the United States. So if we're going to use the United States system of measurement in class, um, we're going to need to know how to convert from one to another when we get to physics. You know, and I ask you if we're going, uh, you know, yards per hour, how many furlongs per hour is that going to be? Uh, so the more uncommonly used measurements that we use in the United States are the things like the mill and the link and the chain and the rod and the pole and the perch and the hand. Um, actually, if you'd like an interesting challenge, look up and see if you can figure out what a few of these things are used for. Um, my, my favorite measurement, I believe, is the, the hand. Um, so that's, 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 this is the only one that I've ever actually measured something myself in. Um, the, other ones, the other ones maybe you can find. It'd be a fun challenge. Let me know. So, if we're going to use the English system or the customary system, um, that was just length. So let's talk about the other measurements that we do, because we also measure volume. And you're very familiar with gallons of milk and quarts. Um, did you know that there's a different volume if something is a liquid or something if, it's a, if something is a solid? So like a quart of water is actually different from, say, a quart of flour. Uh, this becomes very interesting if you are baking that's why in your kitchens you have separate measuring cups for liquids and for solids. Um, don't ask me why, that's just the way that it is. We also have, you know, teaspoons, tablespoons, but there's drams and gills and pecks and bushels. Um, I have a couple things in my classroom I can show you. One is a bag that says on it that the volume is, I believe it's a half of a peck. That's what it says right on the bag for its volume. Mass is another type of measurement that we use. I mean, we have pounds, but we also have apothecary pounds. Um, anybody know what, what an apothecary is? An apothecary is an old name for a pharmacist. When I was growing up after school, I used to go to the apothecary shop because they had really good like fountain drinks there. Um, so that means that if you have a pound of aspirin, that's actually like a different measurement than a pound of meat, for example. Um, it's, it's actually a different unit. And speaking about pounds, have you ever heard someone ask the question, you know, what weighs more, a pound of feathers or a pound of gold? It's kind of a trick question because a pound of feathers actually weighs more than a pound of gold because they are different measurements. Gold is measured using, using the Kern scale. And um, so a pound of gold is actually only 12 ounces while a pound of feathers is a full 16 ounces that we usually think of as a pound. So if anybody ever asks you something like, what weighs more, a pound of feathers or a pound of gold? The right answer is a pound of feathers. 
So in addition to the apothecary measurements, we have drams, um, we have carats, we have scruples and pennyweights. Uh, I see things that are measured in pennyweights a lot. Uh, if any of your parents work in construction, for example, um, nails are measured in pennyweight. Whenever you go to Home Depot and there's a box of nails that you're looking to buy, um, if you look at them, they are measured. Their size is measured in pennyweight. A larger pennyweight nail tends to be longer and heavier. So these are all of the measurements that we use in the U.S. Uh, I don't want to have to convert between all of these, though. Uh, physics and conversions is complicated enough without having to to know that you know a, a foot is one five thousand two hundred eightieth of a mile when you're doing all your other calculations. So it is actually much, much, much easier to use the SI system. People tend to balk at it, although I think kids are getting better at it. Um, adults really don't want to have anything to do with it um, unless they came from another country. So the beauty of the SI system is that you measure all things in just three units, essentially. If you're measuring length, the only th word that you need to know is meter. You don't need to know furlong and mile and inch uh, and fathom, league. The only word that exists, the only unit of length, is the meter. The only unit of volume that we use is the liter, and the only unit of mass that we use is the gram. Now, I know you're like, Mr. Regal, that's, that's kind of cheating, but yes, those are the words that we use, but we change them. We put things in front of them. We say things like kilometer and milligram and centiliter. Yes, I understand, but those conversions are so much easier because um, all you're doing is, is moving a decimal point. Um, whenever you actually convert from one of those prefixes to another, it's just as simple of knowing how many, how many places to move the decimal point, uh, and you can actually imagine it getting bigger that way. So the system of measurement that we use now uh, is called the SI system, and this is the system that uh, almost the entire planet uses. It's the modern version of the metric system. As I said, the metric system really hasn't existed for, for several hundred years. Um, so the, the actual name of the measurement, though, is called the International System of Units. So you might think it's odd, you might think that it might be a typo, that I keep calling it the SI system. Um, you would think that I would call it the IS system, but that's not the way that language works um, in other places. So many of you are taking in school romance languages. Um, one of the ways that romance languages are grammatically different from English is that they describe their adjectives uh, actually come before nouns. Um, I'm sorry, I said that backwards. Um, their, their adjectives actually come after the nouns. So while we would call this the international system of units, then most people, when they're speaking Romance languages, and that's where uh, a, lot of, a lot of this was, was done, this was actually kind of started in France, uh, they would call it the système international. Uh, and there's some interesting uh, examples that I, that I sometimes like to give about why that can actually be a, a better way to talk. Um, it's a fun conversation to have in class. So there was a French guy a long time ago, 1670. His name is Gabriel Mouton. And he was the person who came up with the metric system, or at least the one who gets credit for coming up with the metric system. And Essentially, so that we could all agree on trade and whatnot, and there was some really important um, historic events happening with overthrows of governments and monarchies falling and, you know, the different classes of people getting turned on their heads. Lots of interesting stuff was happening uh, back in this kind of time period. But essentially, the, the metric system caught on, and all of the countries um, on the planet just about got together at a uh, city called Meter and signed a treaty that says we will all use this system of measurement. And yes, that does include the United States of America. So we signed a treaty in 1865 that said, yes, of course, we would love to use the metric system just like everyone else.
that seem odd? Does it seem odd that back in 1887 we signed a treaty that said we would use the metric system, but we don't really use the metric system? We also, Congress passed a law, um, I don't know the exact date, but it was sometime around, uh, like when I was in school, like we'll say the 80s, um, passed a law that we would be com completely converted over into the, the, the metric system within like 10 years. Uh, so not only did we sign a treaty so all the countries on the planet could really kind of be upset with us, um, but, you know, we also passed a law, so we should also all probably be in prison or something um, for breaking the law. So we just don't really want to switch over to the SI system. This map represents the countries on the planet that don't use the SI system. So all of the gray countries are the ones that use the SI system when they measure things, and the red countries are the ones that don't. So quick geography lesson, what country is this? That would be the US. Uh, what country is this? Did any of you say Alaska? Alaska is not a country. That's also the US. A, what country is this? I can't fool you twice, can I? Yep, that's not Hawaii. That's the US. So, uh, so the US doesn't use it, and there's a couple of other countries. This one is called Liberia, and Liberia is actually a country that we helped make. It was kind of created, and, and the, populace, uh, the populace back then, anyway, when it was made, was made up of slaves that were freed from the United States. So we kind of like, I don't know the history, I don't know how we carved the country out of this part of Africa, I don't know if I want to know, but um, yeah, so this, this was made up, so it was kind of like, you know, Americans sort of created this place of land and, and told people once, the, once we had done away with slavery that if you want to go live somewhere else, you can go live there. And they kind of took a lot of what they knew with them, so they used the customary system just like we do. And this country way over here um, is Myanmar. And uh, Myanmar is not a very nice place. Um, not, not a place that you want to go on holiday. Uh, one of the stories that was relatively recently about Myanmar is that it was so bad there that there were a bunch of monks that were um, setting themselves on fire to protest. That's got to be bad if that's what you're doing. So this leads us to the first booby trap. Um, so this booby trap is 10 questions, and it is about the history of the measurements and um, the SI system and just kind of general knowledge about it. So now let's jump ahead and we will start talking about some actual measurements. For each type of measurement, you are going to need to know like a definition, a unit, a tool, um, and some sort of fun fact. So, length, you can define length as the measurement from here to there. So, so possibly the, you know, the distance from this spot to, to this spot, that would be the length. The standard unit we use is the meter. And, fun little fun fact about the meter. Um, originally, the idea of the meter was that it was supposed to be about one millionth of the circumference of the Earth. Something along those lines. They were using the planet to be the basis of the unit. Um, so if that worked out, we could take the meter stick, if you had a million of them and laid them end to end, it would go around the, the, the planet and all, everybody's all happy and everybody can agree on that because we all live on the planet. The problem was when you got all the scientists together to kind of agree on, on what the actual length would be using this idea, the planet is not actually a ball. It's not a perfect sphere like you probably think when you look at a globe. The planet looks more like a, like a tough beach ball that has somebody sitting on it. It's a little squashed. So you get a different distance around the planet if you measure it different places and at different angles. Um, so people from different countries wanted that measurement to go through their country. And you then had a whole bunch of people that couldn't agree on what the length of the meter should be based on that, so they scrapped the whole idea of basing it on the size of the planet, and instead based it on something that everybody did think went the same speed all the time, and that was the speed of light. So now the definition of a meter is how far light travels in a really 
really, really small amount of time. So let's compare some of the SI units to units that you know. There is a whole section on the quiz which is comparisons like this. So I focus more on relativity. Um, so do you know what the sizes of things are relative to other things? Because that's actually how we use things. That's how we can relate to things in our head. Um, so I don't focus so much on knowing the exact numbers for the calculations because I want you to have more of a real understanding of, of the measurements than just proof that you can work out numbers that doesn't actually show that you understand something. It shows that you can do the mechanics of math. Um, so one inch is about two and a half centimeters. So an inch is then bigger than a centimeter. A meter is slightly longer than a yard. If you hold up a meter stick and you hold up a yard stick, you can see that the meter stick is about three inches longer. And this is the one that throws people off. Uh, this is the one that students sometimes, you know, those first two were easy because you can actually see that in class. You can see them on a measuring tool. But when you start talking about distances and things like miles, um, it makes it much more difficult to conceptualize and to, to actually accurately imagine. So a kilometer is equal to 0.6 miles. So think about that. Does that mean a kilometer is bigger than a mile or if a, is a kilometer smaller than a mile? Correct, hopefully. A kilometer is smaller than a mile. Because if we say this another way, we could say a kilometer is equal to a half a mile. 0.6 is pretty close to a half. So if you think about it that way, um, you won't get them confused about which is bigger. A kilometer is about a half a mile. It's just a shade more than a half a mile. The runners out there never get it wrong because the people who go running, especially cross country, their races are measured in kilometers. If you ever hear people running a 5K or a 10K, um, a 5K is a little bit over two miles. So we measure things using the meter stick. And here is a meter stick. So what is this measurement? Those of you that have had tech class, can, can attest that reading an American ruler is, is actually, it, that, that's, a, that's a difficult task. That's challenging, especially to people that don't do well with fractions, because American rulers are based on fractions. Reading a SI system ruler, a, a, a meter stick, is amazingly simple. All you have to do is be able to count to 10. So here we have, these, are, these measurements are in centimeters, here we have 15, 16, 17, 18, well, it's, it's evenly divided up into 10 equal spaces, so it's 16.1, 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0.5, 0.6, 0.7, 0.8. So much simpler than an American ruler. So when people complain about measuring things in meters, it just doesn't make sense to me. What about this one? Notice I changed the unit on you, so I want this in millimeters. So if the numbered spots on a meter stick are centimeters, millimeters are what we call the tiny little lines. Um, centi, think about cents in a dollar, there's a hundred cents in a dollar, there's a hundred years in a century, that's what that prefix means, so that means there are a hundred centimeters in a meter. Milli confuses people, because milli doesn't mean million. Milli means thousandth. Um, so there are a thousand millimeters in a meter stick. But that means that there are exactly 10 millimeters in a centimeter. So if the answer is supposed to be in millimeters, make sure you don't answer three centimeters. Make sure you actually answer it in millimeters. Now you can count up all the tiny little lines if you want, or you can remember that there's 10 of them in there, and here's three centimeters, so the answer is a nice 30 millimeters. Mass. The definition of mass is that it's the amount of matter or stuff that you would find in an object. Um, the standard unit of mass that we use on Earth is the gram. 
the issue with the gram though is that grams are really tiny. Uh, a gram of mass is pretty equal to a paperclip. Uh, if you hold an American nickel, that has a mass of five grams, which is uh, just happens to coincide with the fact that it's worth five cents. So that's an easy standard to to, to remember. Um, but since the gram is so small, like let's say I wanted to know how many grams a car was or even a person, the number would be really big and cumbersome. So most of the time when people talk about mass, especially when they're talking about everyday objects, um, they will refer to them as kilograms instead of in grams. The numbers are just smaller, much easier to, to work with. So a, from conversion standpoint, um, mass and pounds are actually different measurements. Um, we use them often interchangeably. Uh, it's okay to do that for reasons that we'll talk about a little bit. So we can kind of compare them. And if we're talking about on Earth, that's why it's important to, to realize this. If we're talking about on Earth, um, if I was holding something in one hand that was a kilogram and I was holding something in the other hand that was the same size but measured in pounds, the object in the other hand would weigh 2.2 pounds. So that means that a kilogram is much bigger than a pound. It would take 2.2 pounds to be the same as one kilogram. And I said mass is not the same as weight, so we will address that in a few minutes. This is the tool that we use to measure mass. Um, this is called a balance and it actually works like a lever, uh, as you saw in the triple beam balance gizmo that you did. So you put an object on one side and you move these little uh, weights around on the other side until it all balances out and then it tells you exactly the mass. You may think, this is what they use at the doctor's office to measure my weight. Well, that's a little bit of a lie because they're actually measuring your mass. Um, what that is, is a balance. Um, the tool that we use to measure weight is actually something else. So, how do you read a triple beam balance? You did this on the gizmo, so this should still be kind of review. You start with the bigger number and then work your way down. So this would be 132.5, and the units that we use are grams, so this would be 132.5 grams. You just add up all the numbers on the slides. This one would be a hundred and fifty what? Sometimes people shout out a hundred and fifty five. Be careful. This is a hundred and fifty point five grams. So how is it that mass and weight are different? Mass, remember, is the measurement of the amount of stuff that's inside of the object. Weight is actually a force that is gravity pulling on the stuff in the object. So if I were to really break mass down, I would say that mass is like the number of atoms or molecules that are in my body all of my organs and my blood and my skin and the air in my lungs, all of those atoms would be my mass. Weight is, a, is, is what happens when, it, when the planet's gravity is pulling on all of those atoms. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of a feeling that way. So there is a measurement of weight in the SI system, and we're actually going to talk about it, later in the year in physics, and that the, the unit is called the Newton. But nobody ever says, hey, how many Newtons do you weigh? No, that's, that, that would be stupid. Um, people talk about, when we're talking about um, our size, we use mass most often when we're actually thinking about what we're even talking about. So the tool that we use to measure weight is the scale. And I'm sure these look familiar. I said that we would see the tool that we use to measure weight. Um, many of you might have these like in your houses, in your bathrooms, maybe in your tackle box. Um, scales function using a spring. So inside of here we have a big coiled up spring 
and when you stand on this it flexes the spring and that spring is actually measuring how much gravity is pulling down on you. How much force does it take to coil and uncoil that spring? These work the same way. There's a spring hooked up here, actually on here, and like you hook the fish or whatever it is you want to measure and it stretches the string out and it pulls this thing down and it tells you how much force, the force of gravity that's being pulled down on that object. So how is it that they are actually kind of different things? Well, notice in the last comparison we talked about how a kilogram is bigger than a pound on Earth. Well, that's because of Earth's gravity. If you were to go somewhere else in the universe, that wouldn't be necessarily the case. The moon's gravity, for example, is one-sixth that of Earth's. So that means if you weighed 120 pounds on Earth and you went to the moon, would you have, what would happen, like, would you have more gravity, would you have the same amount of gravity, or would you have less gravity pulling down on your body on, on the moon? You, you would have less. You would have one-sixth less. So what would your weight actually be on the moon? If you weighed 120 pounds and you went to the moon, you would only weigh 20 pounds. That's why when you see old movies of people, like, walking on the moon, it, it, like, they're, like, jumping around. Um, because they're so light. And if you think about it, it's actually kind of dangerous. Like, if your muscles are used to moving an arm that might weigh, you know, like 10 pounds or whatever, those muscles are now moving an object that only weighs, like, a couple of ounces. Um, so it would be very easy to, you know, like, move your arm too fast um, and, and do something, like, you know, cut a hole in something or, you know, punch something that you didn't mean to, break a finger, who knows. Um, it'd be very easy to do something like that. So one of the things about those spacesuits that they wore is that they were really heavy. Um, they, they made them weigh a lot, you know, like a, a few hundred pounds, so that it actually felt more normal when you were in space. So um, your weight would change when you went to the moon because there's less gravity. What would happen to your mass? So I'm on the Earth, and remember I described mass as being like all of the molecules that make me up. I go to the moon. Do I have a different number of molecules that make up my skin and my organs and my blood and my bones? No. My mass would stay the same. So what's interesting is if I took one of those triple beam balances that measured, you know, things in grams that you saw the picture of earlier, and I used it on Earth, it would tell me that something weighed like 20 grams. If I took that same tool to the moon, and I put the same object on it, it would still say that it, that it had a mass of exactly 20 grams. Um, so the, that tool, that balance, works anywhere, anywhere that's in, in the whole universe, while scales only work really, well, with the measurements that we have on them, um, on, on Earth. It would be a little inaccurate. It would still work, but it would be inaccurate if you went to a different planet. So imagine if you went to a planet that had more gravity than Earth. Like if you went to, say, Jupiter. We don't even know if Jupiter has a surface or not, but let's say that we have a pretend surface on Jupiter, and I throw you on there. Um, you would actually be like crushed under your own weight because your body would weigh something ridiculous like 100,000 pounds. Your heart wouldn't even be able to pump. You wouldn't be able to breathe. It wouldn't be very fun. The closest we ever got to the surface of that was actually a few years ago. We sent a satellite, sent it right into the clouds that, that surround Jupiter, and it lasted like something small like a hundred yards before it stopped sending signals. Um, we assume it just got crushed like a tin can. And that leads us to the second booby trap. There are 13 questions in this one. And let's get on through to the end. <coughs> All right, area. Area is the amount of flat space. You could think of it as like floor, like floor space in a room. To measure area, you measure two units of length. You measure the, the length and the width, and if you multiply them together, you end up getting the area because it's kind of like you are taking the length of the width and if you do it, you know, ten times right next to each other, you end up filling in 
that space. So that's why it's that length times how many widths it is. So you would use a meter stick or, you know, in our class we could use a trundle wheel or something, but it's all, it's all a meter. This is the key thing right here. This is what you really need to pay attention to because I'm certain you know how to, how to measure area from math class. But in, in science, you really need to pay attention to this. So a measurement of area is in units squared. Since it's length times width, let's say this was 2 meters times 3 meters, in the end you end up with 2 times 3 which is 6, but you also end up with m times m. But we don't write it 6m times m, we combine it all together. And how do you mathematically represent m times m? That is the same thing as m squared. So that's where the unit squared comes in. Since you're multiplying two m's together, it has to be m to the second power. And it literally means, if, if the length of a meter was that long, that would be one square meter, two square meters, three square meters, four square meters, five square meters, six square meters. So it's that shape, six of them. And it's a square, a meter on each side. Volume adds another dimension. Instead of it being two-dimensional, it's three-dimensional. <coughs> it is different for solids or liquids in the way that we measure it, so let's talk about them separately. For solids, we take three units of length. Instead of it just being length times width, it's length times width times height. And for liquids, we use a, uh, the measurement of a liter. Um, which is the, the liquid measurement that we'll talk about. So for solids, you would measure if it was a perfect cube, length times width times height, but face it, rarely are things ever perfect cubes. Um, so to truly measure the volume of many solids, we use something called water displacement, which we'll talk about in a little bit. For liquids, we use flasks, beakers, or graduated cylinders. Now in a real lab there are actually other pieces of glassware too, but these are the three basics, the three staples that all of you are going to need to know. And you are going to need to be able to identify these by sight. So here are images of those three devices. So which of these is this? Is that a flask, a beaker, or a graduated cylinder? The key, I think, is right here. I think this looks like a beak, so that is the beaker. This one is easy because it actually looks like a cylinder, and when, it, when we say it's graduated, that doesn't mean that it finished school. Um, that means that it has evenly spaced markings. When something has evenly spaced markings, or if it's separated in, in even spaces, it is graduated. So this is a cylinder that's graduated, so it is a graduated cylinder. And that leaves the last one to be the flask. They all have their own specific uses. If you are looking for really accurate measurements, in fact, if, if you actually want to have at all close to an accurate measurement. When you're measuring liquids, you need to use the graduated cylinder. So we use this device if we actually want to know a specific amount or if, it, if we're measuring a chemical to mix together and it has to be accurate. Beakers are useful mostly because they hold things. We use them as more storage or transportation. Um, if I'm setting things up and I just want something to put a chemical in, that's a good job for a beaker. Flasks are very useful for mixing chemicals together, um, much more so than, than a beaker, because uh, you can put them in there and then you can grab a hold of the neck like that or put a little device in here and it makes it spin and, um, and they, they mix together without, without spilling and plus you have a very small surface area on the top so you don't lose as much to like evaporation and whatnot. So here we have the devices. 
Let's see which ones you remember. This is a beaker. If that's a beaker, what is this thing? Yep, right, that's also a beaker. And this is a flask, and that would make this a not a graduated cylinder. That was a trick question. Um, there's no lines on it. It's marking how the, the, the volume. So this is just a test tube. Very simple math. Um, just make sure you're multiplying. If you're measuring a box and you're looking for volume, you do length times width times height. Now, full disclosure, when you see questions like this on an assessment, it's going to look a little bit more complicated because I'm actually going to give you the measurements of all of the sides because you need to show me that you know which sides you're multiplying together. Do you want to know the trick? Find a corner. If you find a corner, the three dimensions all will come off of that corner. See? Those are your three dimensions that you want to multiply together. So 4 times 3 times 2 is 24. Note the power symbol here. Note the exponent. It's different from area. Got to keep these straight. You have to keep area and volume straight with their units. So why, are, why is it m to the third power? It's m to the third power because how many m's are you multiplying together? There are three m's. This is 4 times 3 times 2, which is 24, but it's 24 m times m times m. So instead of writing that, we just write m to the third power because there are three of them. If we had some weird dimensional thing going on where we actually had five dimensions we could somehow measure, it would be m to the fifth power. This one's pretty neat. Uh, it's, it's pretty neat when you, when you actually look and see that this is happening. So when you're measuring volume in a graduated cylinder, like you said, and, and we use those to get accurate measurements so you actually need to know how to use it. When we measure liquid in a graduated cylinder, the material that the graduated cylinder is made from, um, it gets along really well with water. It's hydrophilic. Uh, that, that means water loves it, water really likes it, and it will stick to the outside. So much so um, that the parts of the water, or yeah, the parts of the water that are in it, will actually climb up the sides a bit, leaving a, a dip in the middle. Now, what makes this tough on here is, is that it's three-dimensional. Um, so this is only showing it like sliced down. You wouldn't actually see it looking like this. Uh, you would see a line across the top, and then you would kind of see how it, it would kind of got thick a little bit uh, in here, but that thickness that you're seeing is actually air, not, not water. Um, it, it's kind of like a little weird kind of curved bubble at the top. That is called the meniscus. Um, some of you who like anatomy might also know that you have stuff in your body called meniscus, especially in like your knees. Um, the meniscus in science, in, in chemistry and measurement, is this curve that the water gets at the top, uh, at the top in, when it's put into a glass graduated cylinder, uh, or Pyrex or whatever. Um, what's actually kind of interesting is if you were to put oil in here, you would also get a meniscus. But oil and water are opposites from each other, like chemically speaking. Um, we always say that they don't mix, and even in this case. So the, the tube is actually... Um, phobic of, of oil. It doesn't like it. It kind of repels it. So you still get a meniscus, but you get it like bubbling up in the middle and the low points are actually on the outside. Um, it's it's kind of it's kind of neat. So here we have a meniscus in a graduated cylinder and when you are measuring from this, you always measure to the lowest point of the meniscus. Doesn't matter which way it's curving, you always find the lowest point in the curve and that's where the device has been calibrated. So here we have 70 and the units that are all, just about always on a graduated cylinder unless you have some super weird graduated cylinder, uh, the units are always going to be milliliters. So it's one thousandth of a liter. 
So this would be 70, and then this is 80. So the first task when you are figuring out a graduated cylinder is figuring out what we're counting by. So if that's 70 and that's 80, then we're just counting by ones. Where's the lowest part on the curve? The lowest part's here. So it's 71, 72, 73 milliliters. This one's just a little bit tougher. Um, the most important thing to realize on this is that students sometimes mess up. It's the big line that's 35, and it's the big line that's 40. So if this is 35 and that's 40, what are these lines counting by? They are counting by ones. So if the lowest point in the curve is between one and two, we can say that that's about a half. So that would be 36 and a half milliliters. This one you might be saying is not in your notes. It actually is in your notes. It's on like the previous page. Um, so on this one we have 40 down here. We have 41 up here. So what are we counting by? Most people, most students, most actually probably even adults, um, if I showed them this and said, what is the measurement on this device? A very common answer would be something along the lines of 47 and a half. It would be a common answer because you would start at 40 and you would count up that it would be about seven and a half and you would say 47 and a half. Most people then wouldn't think to realize that 47 and a half is less than 41. So that answer makes no sense uh, until after it's all said and done, you point it out and they go, yes, I probably should have seen that. Um, so this is not counting by ones, this is counting by tenths. So it's going to be 40.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, and about 40.75 milliliters. <clears throat> so that's all fine and good. We can measure the, the volume of a box, you can find the corners, but what if you had something like a chess piece? That would be amazingly complicated. All the curves and the angles, uh, and the little nodules and the indentations, that would be nearly impossible to actually figure out the volume of that using some kind of math and, and meter stick of some kind. But thanks to uh, the, the boy Archimedes from a very, very long time ago, um, we actually have a really, really accurate way of measuring volume of, of objects. And in, in many cases, it's actually even more accurate and more easy to measure the volume of anything this way that people actually rarely even use meter sticks or measuring devices to figure out volume. So Archimedes, you have probably heard of him. Um, hopefully the name is ringing a little bit of a bell in your head that you learned in some type of history or science history class. I'm hoping that it's, that it's, you've never heard of him at all. Because maybe you don't remember the name. I'm sure you've heard the story of the guy who shouted Eureka and was all excited and ran through the streets naked because he was so excited to tell the king that he figured out the problem that had been bugging him. Uh, he was in the bath when he figured it out and he didn't even think to put clothes on. He was so excited and he ran through the kingdom shouting the word Eureka, which means I figured it out. It's Greek. Well, it's a really fun story. Nobody knows if that's really what happened. Probably not what happened, but I do really like the story. Um, but Archimedes, there's, there's some speculation as to how this actually came about. Um, as the story goes, um, as the myth goes, whatever you want to refer to it as, the, the king had a crown made, and um, when he got the crown back, he was happy about it, but then he started to think that that the metalsmith, the, the, the blacksmith that made the crown, had stolen some gold from him and, and replaced it with silver, you know, a, a well, you replace gold with silver, that, that, it's not like you replaced it with stone. Um, and he, in order to figure out if the crown was solid gold or not, you had to figure out the density of the crown. And in order to do that, um, you had to figure out the exact volume of the crown. And Archimedes figured out that if you take any object, oh, here's Archimedes. Hmm, this is entertaining. Uh, this is a little cartoon. I don't know how entertaining it is, but this is a little cartoon that illustrates Archimedes' last words. 
The last words spoken by Archimedes were, don't disturb my circles. Archimedes was a um, pretty famous guy. He lived out on an island off of Greece, and he invented lots of really cool things to protect the island. Uh, we'll talk about one of them called the Archimedean Claw, which was this big thing that went out in the water and would kind of flip ships over. Um, the, the legend has it, and there's pretty solid evidence for it, that he actually invented a system of, of mirrors that would focus light like a laser and set the, shale, the, the sails of incoming ships on fire. Um, he did a lot of really crazy things. Um, but the Romans did eventually overcome the defenses and take over the island, and they were supposed to kind of go find Archimedes because he was a genius about designing things like this, and of course they wanted to use that. And they went into his room, and he was working on something, uh, doing some math, and uh, they didn't have paper. Think about trying to do math. The paper was super, super expensive. No one would waste paper by actually like writing on it. Um, so when they would do math problems, they would actually have a big sandbox in their room. Uh, and they would draw on the sand, and that way you could just wipe it off when you were done, and that, that's, that's how they, they did all of that stuff. Um, but the Roman soldiers came in and walked into his sandbox, and allegedly he said, don't disturb my circles. He was doing some, some serious math. Who knows? He was probably solving something that we could still use today. Um, and the rule was you were not allowed to give a Roman soldier an order unless you were the Roman soldier's uh, commanding officer, and it was punishable by death, so... They stabbed and killed Archimedes. So, there's his last words. So, how does this work? Well, you take water. You find out the volume of the water. You drop an object in the water and see how much the volume goes up. And uh, the, the theory is that the object will fill space under the water, so the water has to move, so it will move exactly the amount of the object that you put in. Those molecules that are in the water have to go somewhere, so they go around it. So let's say I wanted to know the volume of decorative marbles, and hey, maybe you'll do this in class. So let's say I put, uh, you have to put some water in the graduated cylinder. Um, doesn't really matter how much water you put in there, you just have to make sure that when you drop the object in that the water doesn't come like out the top of the graduated cylinder, or even beyond the markings for measurement. Um, so that's all you need to worry about. Figure out where the meniscus is, measure to the bottom, drop the marbles in, we'll say the final water level went to 45 milliliters, and then you just subtract the two. If it ended at 45 and it started at 20, that means the water moved a total of 25 milliliters. So yay, we can now say that the marbles have a mass, or I'm sorry, mar the marbles have a volume of 25 milliliters. Can you say that? Can you say that marbles, which are a solid object, has a volume that's measured in liters? You cannot. Liters are reserved for liquid measurements. You can also use uh, liters to measure air or gases. But solids, you do need to measure in something like cubic centimeters. We have to take a length measurement and, and give them three of them. So centimeter to the third power, for example, or meter to the third power. Luckily, this is a really easy thing to do, uh, to do this math. So it displaced 25 milliliters of water, so the question now is, what is that measurement in cubic centimeters? If I could take a meter stick and measure all the different weird angles and figure out the volume, what would that actually work out to be in cubic centimeters? Well, when Gabriel Mouton designed the original metric system, it's all based on water. It's brilliant. As it turns out, one milliliter of water will perfectly fill a box that is one cubic centimeter on all sides. So a milliliter of water is exactly equal to a cubic centimeter of water. And fascinatingly enough, that amount of water has the right amount of, of molecules in it to have a mass of exactly one gram. All three of those measurement systems are all based on water. That is what they all have in common. That's where it links them all together. It's one of the reasons that the system makes so much sense.
So, we can easily convert 25 milliliters to 25 cubic centimeters. But don't forget to do it, because it is an important step. Um, if you leave your answer as to what is the volume of a solid object in milliliters, you will miss points. You will not get full credit for that. Now, in case you didn't notice, cubic centimeter, cm to the third, can also be written cc, and you maybe didn't understand what that looked like when you saw it, but maybe it makes more sense now that I said it out loud, um, because you've probably heard things on medical shows, you know, like, quick, he needs five cc's of adrenaline or something. Um, that is an actual measurement that means cubic centimeters. Now, here is the question that I do not know the answer to. If cubic centimeters are used for solid measurements and milliliters are used for liquid measurements, why is it that hospitals measure the volume of liquids for shots in cubic centimeters? I honestly have no idea. So, if you know the answer to that, if you have any parents that work in the, the medical field, I'd love to know the answer to that. If you ride dirt bikes or motorcycles or something like that, you probably recognize this CC because that's the measurement that they use for motors. Uh, a 750cc motor, which is what I have on, on my bike, literally means that it has a volume of 750 cubic centimeters. If you take that motor and dump it in a big tub of water, it will raise the water 750 cubic centimeters worth, or 750 milliliters worth if you think about it. <coughs> Density is the last measurement that we're going to talk about, and this is the one that causes students the most amount of confusion, and I honestly am not sure why. It, it comes down to understand, ha having an understanding of the math, I think. Um, students tend to be very good at the mechanics of math. They can work out math problems um, pretty well especially if that's the type of problem that they've been working out for, for that like week in class. They, they know the mechanics of that. Um, but what you should really be striving for is understanding why you're doing that math, why those mechanics actually work. That would give you better insight into, into the way things are working. So intuitively, all of you will easily look at these two pictures and answer this question correctly. Which one of these objects has a greater density? You, you're all going to say this one. No one ever gets that question wrong. This one has a greater density. There's more stuff in it. You know what density is. But later when I start asking questions about density, you, you kind of get in your own way. You trip yourself up. You second guess yourself. Um, fundamentally, you understand that this has a greater density than this. So don't let the math be the part that confuses you. You know what? What if I ask you this question? Which has more dent? Uh, which which has a greater density, a eight-pound bowling ball or a sixteen-pound bowling ball? Well, if you weren't aware, bowling balls are all the same size. That's kind of how bowling works. The ball has to be exactly the same size. So if we have two balls that are exactly the same size, but one weighs twice as much, that means there must be more stuff inside that ball. So if there's more stuff inside the ball, it's more dense. There's more stuff inside of it, and it's the same size, then it's more dense. So density is mass divided by volume. And there it is. This is the thing that confuses students. You're great with everything until this shows up. Yep, that thing right there. When I put this on the board, I hear students yell out the F word. That's right. Fraction. Don't be afraid of fractions. A fraction is just a division problem that you haven't completely solved yet. All right? It's not something foreign. It's, it's actually a, a math problem. You could solve it if you wanted to, if that would make, your, make you feel better about it. If this little line bothers you that much. So... How do we use this for density? 
Well, you have to figure out the mass of the object, and you have to figure out the volume of the object, and then you just divide the two, and that tells you the density. So if I had a cube that was two centimeters on all sides, so if I had a cube that looked like this, and it was two centimeters here, and two centimeters here, and two centimeters here. Oh man, that's hard to do on the iPad. Um, we'd figure out the volume how. Two times two times two. And then it has, so our volume would be eight cubic centimeters. That would be our mass. Um, geez, wow. That would be our volume. Our mass is 16 grams. So we would literally have a fraction of 16 grams over 8 cubic centimeters. Which would give us a nice simple round number of 2. Now remember, this is 16 over 8, which is 2. But the units have to stay in that division problem because you can't actually divide a G by a CM. All right? they're, they're not numbers. They don't work that way. So while the number balances out really nicely with 2, the units must remain in this fraction. That's why the units of density are grams per cubic centimeter. Students tend to th like think sometimes that this is hard. Th this Don't make this harder than it needs to be. You function with units like this all the time. Have you ever heard someone say their car is going 60 miles per hour? That, that's what that is. This is it, that would be miles per hour. This, it's just a rate. So it's grams per cubic centimeter. All of those things are, it, it's just a fraction. You just put that fraction bar in there. So don't let this confuse you just because it's a fraction. You don't need to make things harder than, than they need to be. Now, any unit of density could be, could use any unit of mass and any unit of volume. So we could have grams per cubic centimeter because we have a mass and a volume. Well, kilogram is also a mass, cubic meter is also a volume, so kilograms per cubic meter would also be a density. Any mass over any volume. All right, there is a density that you are going to have to memorize, and that is the density of water. And if you remember, I told you, what is the mass of one cubic centimeter of water? Well, if a milliliter is equal to a cubic centimeter, and I told you that the mass of that much water was one, we're talking about a fraction that says one gram over one cubic centimeter, or just one gram per cubic centimeter. That's the density of water. This is a really important density to remember because there's going to be questions based on it. So I will expect you to remember the number one. I ask a lot. Why is this important? It's important because density determines whether or not something sinks or floats. It has nothing to do with heaviness. This is a really big misconception. If I gave you a rock and said, do you think this will float? What would your answer be? You would respond, no, it won't float. It's too heavy. But that is completely not the way the world works. Weight has nothing to do with whether or not something sinks or floats. Put it this way. Have you ever been on the water? like on a boat. Boats float. Have you ever tried to pick a boat up over your head? Boats are heavy. They don't float because they're light. They're really heavy. They float because they have a very small density. The density of a boat is smaller than one. So think about what kind of numbers are smaller than one. Did any of you say negative one or negative five? Just so you know, 
negative numbers don't work with this because you get density by doing grams divided by volume, mass divided by volume. Neither one of those values can be negative. You can't have a negative volume and you can't have a negative mass. So we have to have a number that's smaller than one that's still bigger than zero. So we're talking about densities of things like 0 0.5, um, 0 0.8, 0 0.004, you know, some kind of a decimal. So anything with a density that's a decimal um, that's in the units of grams per cubic centimeters will float. Anything that has a density that's bigger than 1.0 will sink. A common question students have when, when I say this is what if the density is exactly 1? Um, then it's kind of interesting. It just kind of like moves around. It sort of like becomes one with the water. Um, you know, it might slowly sink to the bottom because of some other forces, uh, but it wouldn't have to do with um, the, the buoyancy of sinking and floating. So this, this is a very hard question. Um, this is definitely a challenging question, but I would like to challenge you to answer it. Uh, and this is something that we will discuss in class and we'll see if anybody is able to work out the right answer. We have a couple quick checks coming up. This one is easy, this is an easier question than you think. Because the measurements that I am looking for you to come up with, you use all the time. And this is the last booby trap in Unit 1. There are 13 questions. Um, so we are going to end up having the practical on measurements, which means you have to show me that you can use the systems. Remember, with practicals, you don't get to fix your mistakes. And we're going to have the quiz. And then we will have the Unit 1 exam. Good luck, and don't forget to study with your concept maps and try the concept map challenges.